Good afternoon. I'm Viola Gonzalez. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters here in Oakland, and I am uh, very pleased to have you in attendance. And we are today going to spend time really looking at our ballot measures for the state and for our local measures. We have seven measures from the state propositions to look at, and we have 10 ballot measures here in Oakland of a wide range of interests. And so I would like to uh, start um, to give the opportunity to our two presenters, uh, Gail Wallace and Anna Matai to please proceed. And welcome everyone. A uh, recording will be made of this and will be available later. Thank you. Thank you, Viola. And hello to everyone who's present here today or is gonna use this resource in the future. Uh, we're gonna go through the ballot measures uh, that are at the state, uh, county and local levels. I will present local and county and my partner, Anna, will be presenting the state measures when I finish. I just want to say to anyone who's using this resource that you should just relax because the likelihood is that you'll rep remember less than 50% of what we cover today if this is your first pass out at it. And I've been telling people that what they should do is think of this as putting on a first coat of paint and that you will have resources that we'll be sharing with you in a follow-up email uh, that are on our website. Those resources include two to three minute videos on each of these local measures, as well as one page summaries of the information that I'm presenting today. All right, I'm gonna begin to share screen so we can launch into our presentation. Okay, let's launch into the ballot measures that we have for our, our decisions this November. As you see, can see from this slide, we have seven state measures, we have 10 city measures, and one county measure. We're gonna begin with the local measures. But before we do that, I wanna give you a sense of how these Oakland ballot measures wind up in front of you. They can either be brought to you by the city council, and that constitutes the majority of the measures that you'll be deciding, or they can be put on the ballot by the Oakland Unified School District, which is one of the measures that'll be before you, or citizens can collect signatures and qualify a measure as an initiative. That is another one of the measures that we'll be deciding. Let's get started. And I'm gonna follow these through the way they'll be presented in your ballot materials, that's to say in alphabetical order. So measure H is our first one here. And you'll notice that each ballot measure pertains to a, a particular area. This is a tax measure, a parcel tax in particular, and it's going to require a two thirds vote as a parcel tax measure. This is the one that has been put on the ballot by the Oakland Unified School District. And it concerns uh, a measure and a, that put a parcel tax uh, on our uh, laws in 2014. That parcel tax was labeled measure N, it was $120 parcel tax. And it was levied to support an innovative program that would develop pathways to careers for high school students. Its premise was to integrate learning with work experience and uh, career-based learning. That measure, which was uh, approved by the voters, will expire in June, 2025. So it has provided a stable source of income for the program and the impact has been positive and significant with double digit improvements in graduation rates for African-American and Latinx students. Overall graduation rates have increased from 61% to 73% from the time when the program was instituted through 2019. When, which is the last time that before COVID when we have uh, statistics. What's before you now is a proposal to extend this parcel tax for another 14 years. 
the amount of the parcel tax will remain the same and it will go through 2037. There are exemptions for seniors and low income households in it. And the measure does provide for an independent auditor to issue the annual report and audit. As we go through the slides, I'm gonna be indicating for you on each of these measures, some of the reasons that people put forward to support the measure and some that, that uh, of reasons of the people who would oppose it to help you clarify your thinking as to what values are embedded in each position. Those people who argue to support the measure say that measure N and the program it instituted has been very effective. It's met its objectives and that this measure would provide consistent funding to sustain the program and to continue uh, reaping the gains for our high school students. Those who are opposed argue that yes, it's been a successful program, but we should treat it like a pilot program and we, the funding should come from the school district's budget now that the program has proven its value. So if we vote to approve Measure H, the parcel tax that has been in place since 2014 would continue for another 14 years. If not, it would conclude in June of 2025. Let's move on to our, our next measure, Measure Q. Completely different type of measure. Uh, this only requires a simple majority to pass. And it concerns the development of housing in the city of Oakland. Because there's a law at the state level that says if a city like Oakland wants to build an affordable housing project, the city's voters must approve that project. It's, this is an unpopular uh, law at the state level and is likely to be rescinded next year, but in the meanwhile, we need to deal with it. So the proposal here is to go ahead and meet the conditions of that law and have the voters approve 13,000 affordable housing units. This has no particular fiscal effect because we would not be approving any specific projects. Projects would have to be identified, approved, and funded before there would be any fiscal effect. Let's look at the reasons um, so for supporting or opposing this measure. The supporters argue that particularly with its request for additional bond funding, Oakland has definite intentions to develop affordable housing. And if we pass this measure, then Oakland will be positioned so that projects can move forward without unnecessary delays because they would have already received authorization from the voters. And we really don't have not seen in any uh, anywhere in the resources that are currently available any formal opposition to this measure. Moving on again, Measure R. Measure R has to do with the language in the city charter. The current situation is that the charter uses gender specific language when it refers to city workers and officials. And that the common example is that in the text of the charter, you'll see the word fireman, for example. You will also see pronouns that are gender specific, like he and she. So every measure proposes a change and the ch change proposed here is to move from gender specific language to gender neutral language in the Oakland City Charter. So those specific words like fireman would be changed to firefighter and the pronouns she and he that are gender specific would be changed to a gender neutral they. There's no real consequences fiscally from this since it's simply a change in the text of the charter. Supporters say that adopting these changes would reflect the diverse gender identities of the city's staff and workers. And in addition, there are professional guidelines operative at the state and, and within professional uh, organizations of state governments that have moved in this direction. It would align us with those professional standards. 
Again, we see on this one, there's been no formal opposition or arguments published. Moving on to measure S. Measure S concerns uh, non-citizen voting. Let me give you the current situation, which we have here as background, which is that only United States citizens who are 18 years of age or older may now vote in elections at the state level and in Oakland elections. Um, Non-citizens cannot vote. And non-citizens, that category would encompass people who are legal permanent residents, people who have work visas, as well as people who are undocumented. The current situation in Oakland is that there are 13,000 approximately non-citizens who have children in the Oakland schools. The current situation I'm going to take us across the bay for a second because San Francisco has a law very like the one that I'm going to describe in a moment that's proposed here. It's been in place since 2016. It's a law that would allow non-citizens to vote in school board elections. Uh, it has recently been challenged and declared unconstitutional at the trial court level. It's up on appeal, so the law is unsettled. So all of that is part of the current situation. Every one of these measures proposes a change to the current situation. And the change proposed here is that Oakland follow in the steps of San Francisco to change our city charter to allow non-citizens to vote specifically and only in school board elections. And if the law passes, that would cover parents, guardians, and legal caregivers of children in San Francisco. I'm gonna move on to this slide on budget effects, but I wanna take a moment to explain that there are budget effects only if both steps involved in passing this measure take place, because passing the measure is just the first step. It enables the city to change the charter. That charter change would permit the city to pass an ordinance. Only if the ordinance passes would there be budgetary effects to, to the extent that there would be costs for administering elections and costs of keeping track of additional voter data. There are proponents and opponents to this. Those in support argue that parents and guardians of children have the most incentive to elect good school board leaders and their voices should be heard. They say that allowing uh, people who have children in the school system, including non-citizens, non to vote in school board elections would promote educational policy that considers the needs of marginalized community and encourages participation in the civic process. Those who are opposed are concerned that because immigration laws are specific and strictly interpreted, non-citizens could risk significant unintended consequences by the release of their information or by consequences from them failing to uh, utilize the system properly and even unintentionally to follow all the laws. All, they also argue that implementation will be difficult and could be costly given the need to set up a separate voter registration system and to conduct effective public outreach to inform residents about these new rights. Finally, people argue that given the unsettled situation arising from the litigation in San Francisco, that Oakland should wait for those lawsuits to be settled and avoid unnecessarily legal challenges and expenses. So if you vote yes for this, then the first stage of a process will be authorized. The charter will change and the door would be open for the city council to pass an ordinance explaining how non-citizens could vote. They would have to uh, negotiate that ordinance with the registrar of voters. If you vote no on this, then the law remains as it is and the only people authorized to vote in Oakland elections would be citizens who are at least 18 years of age. All right, um, take a breath. <laughs> We've still got more. It brought us a lot to decide this election. 
This next measure, measure T, has to do with business tax rates. And again, we're gonna begin with what the situation is now, the background. All businesses in Oakland pay a business tax. They're classified into different categories, such as grocers, hotels, and motels, and or manufacturing businesses. And those businesses within one of those categories all pay the same yearly flat tax, regardless of how much money they make. Measure T, remember I said that every one of these measures wants to change something. So this measure wants to change the business tax from a flat tax to a progressive tax. That means that businesses within each category would pay higher rates when their gross receipts uh, are larger. Right now, Oakland has about 60,000 small companies and just over 50 large companies. So about 10% of the smaller companies would actually have a reduction in taxes under Measure T. Other companies, some increase. Companies with administrative headquarters in Oakland that earn more than 20 million could pay many times more what they pay now. What would the effect be? The effect on the city would be that the city would net additional revenues in the general fund, approximately 21 to $22 million worth of additional revenues. And I've given you a reference point of the fact that current business tax revenue is 104 million. So that would bump it up to approximately 125, give or take. Let's look at what people are saying for and against this measure. Those people who support it look around and say that other cities like uh, San Francisco, Richmond, and San Jose, who have adopted progressive tax rates, are showing us that this is the direction in which municipalities are moving and that it's a fairer way to uh, establish the business tax rates. The other reason given in support of this is that there has been a very extensive process in the city of Oakland to bring this particular measure to the voters. There was a, a Blue Ribbon Task Force made up of many different members of the community, the business community, the labor community, um, and the city uh, employees who considered this for many months. Their report was then considered further by these various communities. And there were options from of business and labor and the city council members to each bring their own ballot measure to us. And instead they compromised on this one and the this rationale saying, okay, these are the people most knowledgeable. They've put all of the party's interests on the table and this is the compromise they've come up with. So uh, that let's support it. The reasons to oppose it are that um, as at any time when taxes are raised, people grow concerned that businesses might leave Oakland. People who are opposed also would have preferred that the tax increases be introduced slowly or that there be a choice to vote for a measure that introduced the taxes more slowly. Uh, so if you vote yes for this measure, then the tax uh, code in, in Oakland will change. It will become a progressive tax code. And if it, it does not succeed at the ballot, then the tax code will remain as it is. Measure U presents us with yet another, what I call a money measure. We have actually quite a few of these on, on, our, on our ballots. It's a bond measure. It requires a two thirds vote to pass. And I've created a bit of a table here to help you see the connection between the current situation and what is being proposed in this measure. So what's operative now is measure KK, which Oakland citizens, Oakland voters approved in 2016. That was a bond measure for $600 million divided up into these categories that you can see on the left, 
affordable housing, street paving and reconstruction, and the repair of city facilities. Those bonds have been being issued, projects in those various categories have been being formulated and approved and um, projects undertaken, probably some even completed, and the bonds have been issued as needed in that process. The What's before us now is what I have been calling a successor measure to measure KK, since some of the bond money approved in KK will run out. I believe the affordable housing money is the one closest to being fully expended. So passage of this bond would authorize another 850 million in bond debt, and it would be apportioned as you see. This time around, affordable housing would take the lion's share and then street paving, pedestrian safety, uh, and other transportation needs, and finally, the repair of city facilities. So let's look at the fiscal effect if this bond measure passes. For this particular measure, the estimate is that when bonds have been issued, probably the maximal addition to the tax bill would be $70 or $67 uh, per $100,000 of assessed value for the houses or the properties of property owners in the city. Um, so for an example, if you had a, an, a house with an assessed value of $500,000, you would pay an additional $335 a year in taxes. I think it's really important though to also take note of the fact that Oakland recently adopted a policy to limit taxation so that the what we are taxed to repay bonds does not rise above a certain level in any given year. The policy that they have adopted is that you would not pay as a homeowner more than $220 per uh, $100,000 of assessed property value. That's actually what is estimated uh, homeowners will be paying uh, this year, the 22-23 year. So how do they keep it to that level? The idea is that since bonds are, you know, uh, put forth in issues or in tranches, they would issue proposed bonds only as older bonds are retired or as the tax base grows. And this measure, since it is a money measure, per usual does mandate an independent audit and oversight by the same committee that's overseeing the expenditure of bond funds under Measure KK. What are the proponents and the opponents saying? Those who support this say this is very necessary to continue the work begun under Measure KK because there are still many streets that have not been paid, many other uh, improvements that need to be made in the transportation sector, um, both to update things and to ensure safer roads in Oakland. Certainly there is much need for additional affordable housing. And if you will think back to those that, that measure where we were asking for approval of a certain number of units to be built, this is where the money would come from to build that low income housing. And uh, finally, uh, people who support this say, we live in an older city, there are aging city facilities that need repair and bonds are the way that cities finance these bigger projects. Those who oppose say that they would like clearer uh, and more stringent oversight standards and they're reluctant to add to the bond indebtedness of the city, saying that taxes are already too high and would prefer simply to pay off bonds and allow taxes to be reduced. So if you vote yes for this measure, then you are voting to authorize bond indebtedness that would be issued of over the course of many years and paid for also over the course of many years. If you oppose it, then the measure KK funds would be utilized, but, but no additional funds would be added to the bond indebtedness. And we would be relegated to those to, to meet these needs. All right, measure V concerns a law in Oakland 
that is referred to as the law about just cause for evictions. And again, going back to understand what the existing situation is, this law, just cause for eviction, establishes tenant protections. And it ident does that by ident identifying different tenants' actions, such as a failure to pay rent, which would justify an eviction. So a tenant has to actually do something in the list of things that justify an eviction in order for uh, a landlord to be justified in bringing an eviction process. These protections, though, apply only to buildings built before 1995 currently. And they do, aside from delineating why uh, tenants might be justly evicted, they, they also have reserved the right to owners to evict in very particular circumstances when owners want to occupy the units themselves or do significant repairs. So we're looking for a slight change here uh, if the, uh, this bill is passed. These people uh, who have proposed this law would like to uh, adjust the 1995 date and bring up uh, many buildings that have been built since then under the purview of this law. So they will bring all buildings that have been built at least 10 years ago. And this will be a rolling process. So if this passes and takes effect in 2023, it would cover all buildings built through 2013. And then as you moved forward in 2024, it would cover all buildings built through 2014. So this would bring many more buildings and many more tenants underneath the provisions of this law. In addition, there's some specific categories of tenants who have been added to the protections, which are those people who occupy motor homes and tiny homes. Finally, another important uh, modification the proponents would like to make is to place limits on the rights of owners to move back into their properties or to do repairs during the school year. It would provide that if you have tenants or tenants are related to people who are children in the school system or people who are working on school sites that uh, they would have a defense to eviction during the period of the year that encompasses the school year. Again, there are proponents and opponents. Uh, those who support it say that this is important because it would make for less displacement and disruption, especially for students and school employees and that the 10-year exemption, including one for ADUs, will, will not discourage new construction. Those who oppose, oppose it um, argue on that, on that latter point. They, they do worry that bringing the date closer to the present moment and providing just for 10 years say that um, you know, it might discourage new construction. Additionally, those who oppose uh, worry that tenant protections might discourage landlords from renting to people who have protections, especially people who are uh, working in the schools or families with school children. So if this measure passes, then these changes would take place to bring the date up to within 10 years. Uh, it would provide extra protections during the school year and um, the other changes that we talked about. Otherwise, the uh, eviction law will remain as it is now. All right, we're coming to a measure here that uh, is very concerned with our elections. And the situation we have right now is that is one that's true everywhere, which is that running for public office requires significant resources. But very few people uh, do actually donate. That's particularly true in the city of Oakland, you know, a vanishingly small percentage. Uh, Oaklanders do contribute to campaigns. And then there is also outside money that comes in. Since not many people contribute to campaigns, those who do can acquire outsized significance. There is a way through public campaign financing programs to try and reduce 
the influence of larger donors. Uh, however, the program that Oakland has currently for public financing is a small program and it only is a reimbursement program for people running for city council. So the change that's proposed here is that there, well, there's several changes. The first is that Measure W would create a new campaign funding program with public monies. The program would expand so that registered voters and eligible residents could receive four $25 vouchers. They could donate these vouchers to candidates who would redeem the vouchers for actual currency. And those candidates could be anyone running for any of the elected offices in the city, mayor, city auditor, city attorney, council member, or school board director. Candidates who participate in the program would need to limit their total campaign spending and provide reporting on that spending. And this Measure W has a few other provisions that are focused on increasing transparency and fairness uh, and accountability, uh, especially with elections. It requires that the three highest contributors to a campaign be disclosed on all materials supporting or opposing camp Oakland candidates or measures. And it lowers the limits for donations so that it's less likely that individuals or um, politically active groups can tip the scales with larger donations. Finally, it places uh, more restrictions on lobbying for officials who have left office, would require them to wait for two years rather than one before doing any lobbying. The fiscal effects here are threefold. There's some startup costs, $700,000. There are staffing costs and non-staffing costs of one and a 1.6 million. This is principally to staff up the Office of the Public Ethics Commission, which would run the pu public financing program. There are also costs to fund those vouchers that voters would receive every two years. That would be $4 million for every two years. All told, these expenses amount to uh, a little bit, the figures vary, but in the neighborhood of 1% one half of 1% of Oakland's budget. Those who uh, support this measure say that this will greatly increase the fairness of elections and provide a pathway to office to those who are not connected to uh, large donors. They also point to the program in Seattle, very similar, which has worked well to increase candidate diversity and led to greater participation in elections from people across a range of races, ethnicities, and income levels. Those who oppose point out that because of uh, Supreme Court cases, candidates may choose not to participate uh, and still have some kind of an advantage in the election. Others say that Measure W will cost too much and is not an effective use of city funds. As you can see, we have many, many measures as Oaklanders to decide. So take a breath. Remember what I said. No need to remember this. You've got resources to refresh. This is just to kind of get that first glance. Measure X also has to do with government reforms, but um, it is more varied. So we've created a, a table here for so that you can kind of compare the very specific changes and I'm gonna run through them for you. It's really very difficult to describe them all as being of one type. So let's go back and forth between the situation as it is now and what's being proposed as a change. Right now, there are no term limits for city council members. They can stay in office as long as they keep winning reelection. And the proposal is to limit council members to three consecutive terms, but allow them to sit out for one term and then return and, and run to be a council member again. Back to what exists right now, city council members can put measures like the ones that we're discussing on the ballot after one public hearing. The change being proposed is that two public hearings would be required before anything could be referred to the ballot. 
With respect to voting in the city council, the current situation is that the mayor does have uh, the power to break a tie. However, in the past, council members who want to prevent things coming to a tie vote, uh, vote as being absent or they abstain so that their vote is not counted as a no and the mayor doesn't have the opportunity to exercise that power to break a tie. This would change that by counting abstentions and absences as no votes. There are also changes in here to, to alter who sets the salaries, particularly of the city attorney and the city auditor. And they, in addition to making the changes as to who is setting the salary, and in each case, it is the Public Ethics Commission that is designated to do that. But there are new criteria for the setting of salary, new standards that require reference to comparable cities and to the consumer price index. On yet another feature and proposed change here, the current situation is that the city auditor and the city attorney can support candidates and ballot measures. They can go out and campaign. And under the proposal, that would not be allowed. I'm going to change slides to show you just a few more of the proposed changes here. Right now, there's no specific number of staff required for the city auditor's office, and the city auditor, auditor has certain authority. The change is that, um, well, a little bit more government experience would be required of any city auditor candidates. Um, they would also have expanded powers to look at records within the administration, and there would be a mandate for 14 full-time staff in the auditor's office. And there are certain changes to procedures used to fill vacancies on boards and commissions. I know that's a lot. It's just, what it's a big basket. <laughs> and the fiscal effect of all of these changes really relate primarily to the staff costs which have been estimated as being uh, about $860,000 annually. What are people saying here? Those who support this measure say that this addresses some of the problems with Oakland's government operations. They believe it will make the offices of city auditor and city attorney more effective for a couple of reasons. One, because the auditor will have more staff to do the uh, increasing number of audits they're being asked for, and that the salaries of city auditor and city attorney would be made more competitive. The hope is that would help Oakland to attract and retain more qualified candidates. Those who oppose this measure object to its piecemeal approach. And they point out how many different, you've seen how many different reforms are bundled together, which makes it impossible for voters to vote for some of these reforms and to reject others. And finally, some people object because the term limits are not absolute in the sense that they allow city council members to finish their three terms, sit out a term, and return and campaign for office. If this measure passes, then uh, the reforms and changes that we've looked at will take effect. If it does not, then the rules that were described and the situations that were described would remain as they are. I believe this is the last of the Oakland local measures. And this is a parcel tax. So we're beginning and we're ending with a parcel tax. However, unlike the first one, which was put on the ballot by the Oakland Unified School District, and which is a continuation of an existing parcel tax, this one is a new parcel tax that came to the ballot through the initiative process. That means that people collected signatures and qualified this measure for the ballot. And that is the reason that you see a different pass rate on this parcel tax than you did on the one that was put on the ballot by the Oakland Unified School District. That school measure for continuing measure N requires a two thirds vote. This requires a simple majority vote. And it has to do with the Oakland Zoo. The Oakland Zoo's annual budget is about $24 million. The majority of its revenue derives from entry fees, memberships, food and souvenirs. And the zoo has been significantly impacted by the pandemic. Uh, the zoo also receives about 8% of its funding from public sources, including the city. 
And the situation in terms of who visits the zoo is that of the approximately 1 million visitors per year, 15% of the visitors are from Oakland. So what's being proposed is that in addition to the public funding that is already directed to the zoo, that this parcel tax, which would last for 20 years, would be uh, imposed and raise $12 million for the zoo's operations, staffing, maintenance, and capital improvement. The amount of the parcel tax is uh, $68 per parcel, uh, residential parcel. And I have pointed out it requires the public funding to say the same. Let's look at the fiscal effects, 20 years, $68 for residential units, including multi-unit residences, and non-residential properties would be assessed on square footage and frontage measurements. Those who support this measure say that the zoo needs the funding, particularly after the last two years, and that it could use the, the funding to expand educational programs with the Oakland schools or, and to offer additional benefits to Oakland residents, such as free passes. Those who oppose this measure say, while it's true that the zoo could choose to use some of the additional revenues in that way, there is nothing in the measure that requires them to spend any amount or percentage of the increased revenues in any particular way. They could utilize the spending for animal care, fire prevention, or educational programs as they deem best. Um, and because of that people, and because of the fact that Oaklanders are, represent only 15% of the annual visitors to the zoo, those who are opposed feel that this is an unfairness to Oakland property owners who would be paying for a 50% increase in the annual revenues to the zoo. All right, you and I have both done it. We're through the local measures. And I have one more that uh, I want to present to you, which is the only Alameda County measure on your ballot. It has to do with regulations that govern agricultural and open space lands in the county. And in particular, it has to do with measure D, which Alameda County voters passed 22 years ago to set ratios um, of agricultural buildings and horse arenas to the land in unincorporated areas of Alameda County. At the same time, they wrote into that measure that any changes whatsoever had to be presented to the voters. And that's why you see this measure on your ballot this year. The proposal is that we change the ratios for the agricultural buildings and the equestrian arenas relative to the land area to allow some degree of expansion. This has been placed on the ballot by the Board of Supervisors of Alameda County, uh, who have had 30 plus public meetings since uh, December of 21. And while there aren't really official funding committees for and against this, we have determined that the Green Belt Alliance has registered its support of the measure. We do not have specific uh, people until we get more materials from the Registrar of Voters to know who specifically might be opposing this measure. But we are aware of some of the reasons that have been given for supporting and opposing. And um, well, the first is that in allowing more space, this is going to make it more feasible to maintain these equestrian facilities and to put on the kinds of performances that are necessary. And that the agricultural expansion for other kinds of facilities is gonna allow more storage and processing and retail opportunities for wineries and olive press companies and others who are in the, these areas. Those who are opposed to it claim uh, that Measure D would uh, unfavorably benefit certain of the larger wineries and disadvantage the smaller ones, and that it would weaken the Alameda County's environmental protections, which were originally intended to maintain certain amounts of open space. 
thank you for your attention. Um, I'm going to turn this over to my partner, Anna Matai, who's going to present the state measures to you.